everybody, and welcome back to a special edition of 135th Scale Figures in Review. Uh, Mr. Calvin Tan, the world-renowned um, figure painter, has uh, given me his brand new uh, three-disc DVD set of converting and painting figures. Okay, now this is an all-out guide to converting, changing, adapting your 35th scale figures to whatever you want to try to do using materials that we basically have, materials that you can get, and, um, and just a plethora of, of information. And there are some other new tips and some new things that are going to be coming out. Okay, now this is a really big three set uh, DVD system that's well over five hours and I'm going to try to con uh, condense it down uh, to being very workable for you guys to look at. So uh, we'll go ahead and get that ball rolling in this edition of 135th scale figures in review. In this video presentation, I am going to show you how easy it is to take a simple plastic figure and convert it using some very, very easy to master techniques in sculpting. Now, a lot of modelers have written to me saying that, hey, Kelvin, I would like to actually customize some of my figures, but I do not know how. And sometimes when I look at some of the magazines, they have like really, really awesome work, but I just can't seem to get a head start in learning how to sculpt. So in this video presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some very, very easy to master techniques to allow you to actually customize your own plastic figures and allow you to explore your own creativity and unlock your imagination. So, without further ado, let's begin. Okay, right off the bat, we're going to stop the video and give you a still because these are the basic tools that Calvin uses when he's going to be reworking and basically painting or doing work on any figure that he has, whether it be a 10th scale buzz, a 16th scale, or a 135th scale figure. A lot of these we have, but some we don't. Uh, a couple of them I'm going to bring to your attention. Okay, uh, number one is these right here, and these are shapers. Okay, these are, uh, they look like paintbrushes, but instead of the, the bristles, they have silicone or rubberized tips to them. Okay, they are very, very important in being able to work the epoxy putties and the different things that he has and uh, been able to manipulate them on the figure. Okay, a couple other things that are a little bit different, you know, he's got some, some uh, soldering wire up here. Okay, but a lot of the other stuff you'll recognize as far as files, nippers, and things like that. He always uses gloves. So right off the bat, this is what Calvin uses when he's uh, beginning to work on these figures. Now we're gonna go ahead and skip up to a certain point here. Okay. And when we get to this uh, portion, okay, it shows you how he's gonna disassemble and begin cutting and working with the figures. Now Calvin will use epoxy putty if I can get to this point right here and show you, okay, as he has the putties, okay, what he'll do is he'll mix the, put, the A and the B parts of putty, okay, put them together of equal parts, but then he'll let it set for a period of time, and that was something I never did. I use Magic Sculpt uh, for my putties, and I just re thought that you just, you know, rub it with uh, talcum powder, roll it out, and you begin working with it. Well, you ever, if you've done that before, it gets pretty sticky. Calvin's advice is you let the putty set after you've mixed it about 10 minutes. And then it doesn't dry, but it becomes a lot more pliable and a lot more workable. Like, uh, like and it'll just make it easier for anybody to be uh, working these things. Now, <clears throat> he's going to take Tamiya figures and, and cut them up. And it'll take two figures to be able to make out of one. And he's changing Tamiya tank crewman into an infantryman. And we'll get to that portion in the video. Okay, if I can move it up here to where it needs to be.
okay? And this part will go ahead and it'll show you, okay? Use a hit from These are the figures that he's already begun to, to work. Okay, now he's gonna replace the head with a horned head. And if you saw one of my videos earlier about working with horned heads, they are second to none as far as replacement heads. Their expressions are excellent. Their scale's pretty good. And remember, when you replace a horned head, you always have to drill out the collar to make it work really well, okay? And like I said before, what he does is be, he'll begin sculpting and begin cutting with these. The tools he uses, he uses very sharp knives, okay, and very sharp blades to be able to cut and shape the figure. I've used for a long time um, our razor saws, and that's fine too, but he chooses to use blades to, make, uh, to do his cutting. So we're gonna go ahead and move up to the next portion of the video. I'll give you a still from that one. Okay, and there's the completed cutted uh, parts. Now he will use white, uh, Tamiya white capped slow curing glue, okay, to basically put them together and be able to shape and be able to kinda Oh, make sure they kind of form themselves up pretty good, okay? Um, but then, if he, when he gets the shape that he chooses to have it in, okay, he'll use the Tamiya's green capped extra thin cement, which is a lot more uh, active, which is, I guess, is a lot more uh, abrasive to the plastic, making sure it stays stuck, okay? He used the epoxy putty, who use evergreen strips to fill the gaps, and it's just really pretty neat how he goes about doing that. Now, once again, I'm showing you bits and pieces, but if you want to really look at this whole thing, it's well worth your time and effort to get the DVD set. I'm going to go ahead and jump all the way up here to the next portion that I want to share with you. Okay. And now this is the wire that he'll use when he's... Uh, adapting arms and repositioning them. Uh, oftentimes I'll use copper wire because it's pretty pliable, okay? But sometimes copper wire can be hard to find. He uses uh, soldering wire, which basically will hold the shape, but of course you're gonna have to use uh, CA glues when you're using these things. But basically what it winds up doing it, because of the pliability of it, it'll allow you to move and maneuver the, the pieces that you're choosing to go ahead and change and reconstruct the figure with, okay? Um, and of course, then you'll use the putties to fill in those gaps. The one tip that I'll tell you about using the epoxy putty with a plastic figure is soften the plastic with the Tamiya extra thin cement or a hard curing cement because that will allow the epoxy putty to settle into the softened up plastic, which is a neat tip. I didn't realize that you could do that, but it works out pretty good, okay? And we'll go up to that portion of the video if I can get to it here pretty quick. I apologize for skipping around, but I just want to get to the main points that I think you guys would find, find fairly interesting, okay? This next portion right here, if it gets up to it, will be able to show kind of how the changes were made to the figure and this is what the horned head put in and now he's using the putty that he let sit for a while and he's using a small blade to manipulate it into the gaps. Okay, he used evergreen strips to cover the big gaps but now to fill in the seams and fill in the gaps that were left by the evergreen, he's using the epoxy putty. And once again, remember, he let it set up for about 10 minutes and you can use the Tamiya extra thin cement to soften the plastic to get the putty to stick there. Okay, that's a great tip. I, I really appreciate finding that and looking at that. Okay, the next we'll go ahead and we'll skip down to No, that's not it. Okay, as we move down, I apologize for taking my time, but I want to find the right spots, uh, right spots for you folks. And that's going to be this next one. Right 
right here. Okay. Now what he's done in this uh, situation, since he's filled some of the gaps of the waist, now he's fashioned a pant leg because he's choosing to go ahead and make the pant leg a little bit baggier than the plastic figure shows. And all he did was he cut and rolled out using the talcum powder that you'll see up here. Okay. And of course that allows you not to have your putty stick to the paper. Okay. He's cut it. Uh, he shaped it to the thinness he wanted it. He cut it to the size he wanted it. And now he's applied it and he used the Tamiya Thin Cement on that plastic to soften it up to let the putty adhere to it. Now he's using a wet, um, a, a dampened um, brush, and now he's beginning to press it into the folds that are already existing there, but he's still just wanting to try to make it look a little baggier than it, what it was, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and show you the next portion. I'll let the video run for a little bit on this one because it is pretty cool how it all kind of turned out when he has it shaped. Okay, we'll let the video run here for a minute. Okay, and that's what Calvin wished to attain when he got the pants a little bit baggier. He's got the waist taken care of. He's got the horned head set up in there, okay? And this is just really pretty cool stuff, okay? We're gonna go ahead and move on to, if I can get to that portion right here of 146 is the next spot. Okay. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make it slightly longer. Because okay. And what he's doing here, he's, he's manipulating one of the hands. He's choosing to make a hand. He changed it from a fist to a pointing finger, which is, which is just superior workmanship. Now, me, the average Joel modeler, I'm probably not going to do something like that. Okay. But... What you can do, if you look at these and watch his videos, you'll be able to manipulate a hand to possibly being able to grip the, the, the gun handle or the pistol grip itself instead of having it just sit in there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and let the video run to the end to show you what the results look like, okay, when he's gotten done and finished reconstructing this figure. Once again, this is pretty amazing stuff that Calvin does, and he puts it out there and instructs you this way so it's very workable for, like I say, us average Joe guys to go ahead and be able to do that stuff. And that's the end result of what you're looking at there with the, the finger that's pointing, okay? Unreal workmanship. And this is how the figure's kind of starting to come together for him with the epoxy putty, with the carving that he's done, all those things. And on the left side is the completed figure, on the right side is the one he's working with for the purpose of the video. Okay, and that kind of wraps up video number one. We're gonna take a break for a second. We'll come back with video two, which deals with the painting of the figure. So we'll be right back. Okay, now we're going to move on to the second DVD of the, of the three DVD set, and this is, deals with the painting of the, of the face, the uniform, and the groundwork, okay? And Calvin's going to explain a few things to you as we go through the beginning of this, but then, of course, we're going to move on accordingly. So here we go. Now we are 
are going into the painting of this figure, which is perhaps the most fun part of the project apart from the groundwork. The techniques I'm going to showcase today are going to be found in my first and second DVD. Exclusive to this DVD special is I'm going to show you how to use um, new techniques using the liner brushes. So, let's begin. So I'm going to adopt a pre-toning approach to this uh, DVD. So we're going to start off with some black, right? Okay, so this is going to help us to reinforce the, the highlights and the shadows using this technique. Okay, now what he's going to do here, he's going to load up his palette. And if you don't have a wet palette and you're painting with acrylics or for that matter any figure painter, you need to invest yourself or find either making a homemade wet palette or getting one from a manufacturer. Uh, one of my uh, videos I made for my 35th scale figures in review shows the advantage of using a wet palette and it is invaluable. But what he's going to do is do what he's doing what he calls pre-toning. And this is a complimentary part to one of his first of his two other videos. Okay, and it really works out pretty slick. Um, you need to, once again, I'm gonna move through here pretty quickly to kind of show you what some of this stuff looks like when he's done the pre-toning. Okay, and if I can move up to where I need to be, I will show you uh, very quickly here. Okay, and in this portion right here, what you're looking at is when he's taking his figure, and Calvin will always uh, uh, prime his figures in black, then he'll mist a light gray over the top to find the shadows. He's using his uh, basic flat white, and he's going in and, and doing the pre-toning with the highlights, okay, on the bridge of the nose, the cheekbones, uh, a little higher on the cheekbones, underneath on the chin. This is something new that he's adding to his painting techniques. He'll also go in with the black and go into the deeper, darker recess. This is pre-toning before you begin working on the flesh tones. And actually, I can't wait to get started painting a figure again because this is one of the techniques that I'm really looking forward to working on, okay? Now, we're gonna go ahead and move up and kind of show you where this all kind of uh where it kind of wound up okay and when i get there this is what it looks like okay now he's done some mixing uh with some other colors too but you'll definitely see as he's done in layers of course once again we're working with acrylics we're all dealing with layers he's putting layers on over the top of his shadowing the pre-toning and uh, the white highlights Okay, and this of course is the beginning part before he, now he starts getting into the flesh tones, which he's shown you how to use in video one and, and uh, DVD set number number two that he already had. Okay, very, very good. Okay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and move up to the next portion. Okay, which is all the way up to 23. Once again, I'm gonna jump around because there's parts that I feel are important that you need to see. Okay. And then that way, if you want to look at the whole thing and it's continuous, it's, again, you're going to get the DVD set. Okay. Because no, I can't explain it to you as, as good as Calvin Tan can. Okay. I think we can save more time. All right. Now, once again, here he is mixing with his, using his wet palette. Calvin is a master of mixing the paints. You know, I believe the Vallejo are his favorite uh, paints to use, but you can use all different kinds of acrylics. But his, how he mixes his paints is amazing, okay? It's one of the great tributes I, I think that he allows uh, people to kind of pay attention to. Now, I won't do my much mixing. I'll add a few colors to change the tones, but he will, he'll get right into it. And his wet palette looks like a mess, but there's always a purpose uh, to the mess that he makes, and it works out really, really well, okay? I'm going to go ahead and skip all the way up now to, let's see, I'm going to go up to 34. And this kind of shows you the end results of how he's working with the uniform and uh, in the pre-toning portion. Okay. And... This is what he's done as far as using a, a flow improver from Vallejo for airbrush, okay? The flow improver literally makes the paints, 
okay, move a little bit better and become easier to paint with other than being so sticky. Okay, this is something new. This is a new technique. Once again, it, it's, it's, it's a Vallejo airbrush improver, okay, the flow enhancer, but he's using it here with his paintbrush. This is another technique I'm gonna go ahead and, and use, okay, because it sure, it sure can hurt. And you see right now he's doing the pre-toning and doing the lines and the recesses on the camo of the helmet, okay? I'll go ahead and show you, if I can get to it, what the helmet kind of looks like when it kind of finishes up. Bear with me just for a second. Okay, and there you're starting to see the, the hard edge camo, okay, the splinter camo cover on the figure's uh, helmet, okay? Um, you see the, the, the shadows or the recesses that he's painted in, in black with the flow enhancer. He also used the flow enhancer to go ahead and create the angles for the splinter camo. And then you see the rain marks he's adding using, once again, that technique of the Vallejo airbrush flow enhancer. Okay, it's once again a, a nice little little tip to, to how that all works. Okay, now we'll go ahead. I'm going to move up to the next portion. Which is right here. And if my video kicks in like it's supposed to. Okay. Okay. And this is preparing the shadows and things like that for the uniform, okay? Now, he added to my flat base, and I asked him, I, I talked to him about this, he just likes to use the Tamiya flat base, which anybody, I mean, that's perfectly fine. But you can use basically uh, a lot, if it's an acrylic paint, you need to find an acrylic flat to use, okay? I happen to like uh, AK's Ultra Matte, so I'll always add a drop of Ultra Matte into some of my paints when I'm painting like this, okay? But it works out pretty, pretty well. Okay, and he'll go ahead in just a minute and he'll begin painting the uniform over the top of these when he's created the pre-toning with the black for the shadows and the white for the highlights. Okay, and I'll move up here to one ten. And that'll get us here. Okay, I'm gonna let the video run just for a little bit. Okay, and so he's, he's showing you what he's doing to, by painting in the just, recesses. Only just one pass, you just have one pass of the color over the same area. Okay, and there you see the, the black is going into the dark recesses of the folds. Okay, and then he's gonna come back with the white and go over the top of the highlights. Okay, and this is all pre-toning, this is even before he starts laying down the colors, okay, for the uniform, all right? which once again, when he does that, he will actually apply it in, I guess you wanna call it glazing. He'll put with very, uh, very thin uh, paints of the uniform color and he'll apply layer after layer until he achieves the right color that he wants without washing out the highlights. Okay, just an, it's an awesome, awesome technique to use, okay? We're gonna go ahead and go all the way up to 128. Okay. And this should be able to show you, okay, the, uh, the uniform as he's getting it finished up. Okay, applying once again the glazes. And there it is. Okay, he's using a, a, a filbert brush, okay, and very carefully, or very well, it doesn't have to be very careful about it, but he's applying thin glazes of the uniform color. Okay, and he's not washing out any of the shadows, he's not washing out any of the highlights. Okay, it's just, an, a, just a really, really good looking uh, way he, he's doing it, okay? And so now we're gonna go ahead and move on to the groundwork, okay? Right, so this is gonna... Okay, now these are his tools that he's gonna use for this groundwork. Okay, 
you can use whatever you want to use. There's a lot of commercial products out there by a lot of different manufacturers to create diorama groundwork. Okay, he's basically doing this all from scratch. Okay, he's making charcoal uh, debris right here, or charcoal gray for the color of the ground. Here's his pedestal, which is great to have. And here is basically kind of homegrown uh, odds and ends. Okay, uh, it's, it's one of those things that you can do what you want to do. If you want to invest money in going out and getting commercial grade groundwork or pick the stuff up from um from uh from around in the in your yard i made a, a vignette uh with a friend of mine uh gave me an idea to use uh, dead grass to make corn stalks which i think turned out pretty good but anyway you can do what you want to do but this is how he's working his groundwork okay all right so we'll move ahead up here to 150. Okay, now what he's doing here, he's making sure using the shaper, okay, that he's able to get his figure to set in the groundwork that he created, okay? And the figure is pretty much done except for the painting, all right? He pre-drilled the hole and used a uh, piece of, of sprue to go down into the drill so you know where your, your, where your uh, trooper is going to be at or your figure is going to wind up being. But he wants to make sure that he test fits where it's going to set. All right, and he's added all the different groundwork to it. He's used um, basically the, 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 the groundwork paste he created. And what a lot of people are doing is they're using mats, uh, matte uh, paints or matte surfacers, okay, to lay it down and it'll stay without like a white glue residue, okay? And it works out pretty, pretty well to keep your stuff there, okay? Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and move up to the two minute mark. Okay. And now what he's gonna be doing here, this shows you how he's starting to paint it. And you paint the groundwork just like you would anything else, but use very, very thin layers, especially to control the paint. Now, when you're working with it, he's also laid down, when he put down his initial groundwork, he, he used masking tape to tape off the pedestal mount. Make sure after you've got most of your groundwork done, you take that tape off and then let the groundwork dry. Don't let it dry with the masking tape on because when you take the masking tape off, it'll mess with the groundwork. So when you've done your initial work and you're satisfied with that, before you let it dry, take that, take that masking tape off that you see right here. Okay, go ahead and remove that because then you can always put it back on, which he did for the painting of, of the base. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and move up to the final... Um, portion of this and kind of show you all what it looks like when he got his groundwork done. And this is basically the completed figure, okay, and it'll show the groundwork in just a second. Okay, just unbelievable detail work. And there you see the groundwork um, where he has, this is the completed uh, figure with his base and everything done. This is the painting all done. This is the, 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 the final product. But you see down here how the groundwork really turned out super. Okay, and once again, this DVD goes ahead and explains that step by step about what you can do. It, it, it'll take the novice up to becoming and doing something like this, which is an amazing achievement. Okay, well that wraps up DVD number two. We're gonna take a short break and then we'll go ahead and get going with DVD number three. Okay, now this video portion deals with the extra DVD that, it, that Calvin put in that shows you how he creates straps and buckles. And for the average Joe, this is pretty intense stuff. I mean, it's very workable. He shows you what he does, it's step by step, but it's like really putting, putting belts and buckles on a 35th scale figure using different materials. The biggest material that you'll see here is called PLA paper, P-L-A paper. It's plastic paper, okay, and Tamaya makes the stuff, and it's actually plastic, but in the, in the thickness of paper that actually bends and glues and everything. It's just an amazing material. I looked it up because I never heard of it before, but it'll, it can kind of change the way I make, uh, I make 
uh, slings for my rifles and strapping and things like that because that's really neat stuff, okay? We're going to go ahead and jump up because this is, like I say, once again, this is pretty, pretty big stuff that Calvin goes ahead and works in. And he's using the paper and he uses epoxies because he basically winds up, winds up recreating, okay, everything on the trooper from kind of the ground up. Okay. Okay, and right here, he created a template, okay, in the scale that it is. Like I say, I'm not going to do that. But now he's creating the straps and cutting everything to size that he wants. And this is the PLA paper. He calls it the plot paper. He's going to cut it to length and begin to work it and shape it. And once again, using Tamiya cements, the, the white cap slow curing to the green cap fast curing, he'll be able to manipulate those into the places that he created um, created for the figure. Okay, in other words, the straps just won't lay across the figure. They'll hug the figure like the real thing. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and move on up to, and we'll show you the results of some of his labors as he's gone through this. Now, Calvin does an outstanding job of taking us through this process. Okay, there's, and I'm just skipping through because, like I said before, if you really want to look at it, you're going to go ahead and have to get the DVD set. But this is just kind of showing you the bits and pieces. These are the highlights. Okay, and there's an example of one of the highlights. These are the straps that he's made for the, for the white straps that go over the shoulders, and that's the belt that he made, and that's created from the PLA, the PLA paper from Tamaya. Okay, we'll move on ahead to the next step which is gonna be up here. Now he's also going to wind up using putty, okay, to fill in gaps also. Okay, now these are the belt buckles he's made using stretch sprue and the paper cut to shape. Okay, this is the belt buckle for the major belt and that is a, uh, a buckle for the white harness that goes across the shoulders. I just wanted to show you the fine detail that he's able to create using that paper and using the blades. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and go up to the next one. Which now, this is kind of where he's getting to be to the point of finishing up uh, the belt. He actually used and he created by wrapping wire around a drill bit, he's created uh, hooks, okay? And he used the PLA paper and he bent it because it won't snap, okay? He bent it and now he's used white glue and he's creating the harness uh, to be able to hook up. The holes that he made here for the, for the strap, right there, those holes, okay? He has a special tool that he uses to make those and those fit, go right into the plot paper. The Tamiya Extra Thin Cement activates and softens the plastic so the strap will actually set into the groove that he created so once again it's just not laying on the plastic figure it is actually becoming part of the plastic figure which is really a, a neat item okay all right uh let's see i need to go ahead and go up to okay our next one kind of shows you what he's been doing and how he created all these little masterpieces with this, with the stuff that he has. Amazing workmanship. Okay, and like I said, in the DVD, he does an outstanding job of explaining everything to us from an expert modeler to a novice, okay, which I would be included in that novice category. Okay, now this is creating the rifle sling or the gun sling for the MP40. And this is using the PLA paper. Okay, once again, you can bend and manipulate it. I'm a, uh, a lead foil guy. I've been using lead foil cut to shape on my weapons uh, forever. Okay, but now you have to use CA glue when you're dealing with the plastic or the, to the resin. Okay, with the PLA paper, you can bend it, shape it. And if you're using a plastic weapon, you can use it to my extra thin cement and it'll get harnessed just perfect, okay? And the folds that he creates are, are, are pretty pretty amazing, okay? It's just really, really good stuff, okay? Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you is what he's done, or what he's done to create insignias 
that just don't lay on the figure. They become part of the clothing of the figure. And he uses archer transfers to do this. Okay, and the technique is really simple and actually winds up being really pretty nifty. I get to it. Okay. Now, what he's done here is he's cut epoxy putty. Okay, remember when you, he laid it out and made it still pliable, he was able to cut small pieces to shape. Okay, and he used the Tamiya uh, extra thin cement to soften the plastic and he laid it down right on top of the painted figure. Okay, and put it into the shape. Then he took an archer transfer Okay, and laid it right on top. In other words, that makes it look more, instead of a decal, it actually makes it look more like cloth insignias on the clothing. Okay, just a really nifty little trick uh, of the trade that Calvin's shared with us. Just a really awesome uh, piece of workmanship. Okay, and now we'll come down here to the last parts of our video, and I'll let the video run for a little while. Okay, as this kind of loads up, I'd like to thank Calvin Tan for sharing this video with me and hopefully I'll be able to get this video out in good shape so everybody can get a chance to take a good look at it and see if it's worth going to pick up or not. And I, I'm flat out telling you, it's worth every penny to go ahead and get these. I'm a Calvin Tan, uh, Tan kind of guy. I like the way he paints. I like how he does things. And this, the videos that he has are, are very, very... Uh, good about explaining the step-by-step -step process that he's made here It's just showing you what he's done to make barbed wire in 35th scale Okay, and he shows you the process by a homemade jig that he created. Okay, we'll go ahead and let this run Okay uh, At the conclusion we'll be all done. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in Hopefully you're you're getting something out of this little uh, review. I have done here um, Now once again, I'd like to thank Calvin Tan for supplying me with this video and I hope everything works out So until next time from 35th scale figures in review, we'll see ya And you should be able to get a nice uh, good 135th scale impression of uh, about wire, right? It's not entirely precise, but I would say for 135 scale, it, would su it will suffice just nicely, right? But I'm sure if you follow this method, you know, this method is going to look spectacular. All right. Yeah, this is how we make the bubble wire. And this is how we make the bubble wire. And once you have done, you can sort of like, you know, attach it to the post. And this is how it looks, the final result looks like.